down with the uh, water earlier, so it's giving me a soft edge. This is an opaqueish paint. It's very opaque because it's a watercolor crayon, which behaves very much like a gouache, except for it has a waxy finish to it, which is what I was explaining in my last video. So it does have a certain amount of layering that you can do, but it does also have a sort of waxy, oily resist that happens. So I'm basically starting by giving it mostly a single color, and I'll come back in in certain areas and darken it up. You can, of course, uh, come back in certain layers when it comes to transparent watercolor. It's a little bit harder to do that with watercolor crayon or gouache because they tend to lift more than staining watercolor. So it is a, a different type of technique that you want to use for painting. But the good thing about these guys lifting easily is that you can make corrections more than you can with staining watercolor or ink. So there's always uh, pros and cons to every tool that you use. And so that is definitely one of the, the pros is that if it lifts, then that also means you can correct easily. So now let me come back and add a bit more brown to my shadow areas. I can just change the color. I might actually make them slightly different brown colors for the bears because that's a, a nice fun thing to do instead of just having them be the one color because they don't really have hair for hair color because they're not people. So this is wet on wet so it's giving me a fuzzy edge. Again when I was doing my comp more complicated Pooh Bear pieces that I was doing on here we were employing the same sort of technique which is that you want to apply this wet on wet and then you get a nice cotton ball edge. And you can just make sure for any kind of fuzzy hair, any kind of fur, anything that has a wooly, soft texture to it, anything from clouds to, you know, anything like that. But it can be animate or inanimate. It just depends on anything that needs that soft edge. Now, don't do it for skin because skin does not have a fuzzy texture. You want to give it more of a smooth gradient, so that would require a different type of motion. But this kind of fuzzy motion will give you a great bear look, teddy bear look. And it works great as a base layer for more realistic wildlife pieces too. So again, this is a simple piece so we can make sure we have a less stressful first YouTube stream ever. So hopefully this works out as a good stream, but if you are doing a more complicated bear piece, then you can always use the same techniques that you use for a simpler piece, except for you basically just increase your layers and you increase your rendering. So your values increase um, in contrast and you also probably don't use ink lines if you want to make it more realistic, although there are plenty of realism illustrators and artists who do still use ink. Alphonse Mucha or Mucha um, is one of the people that does that and there's other people who also have more of a realism style and they still employ a lot of ink, but of course um, if you're doing it depends on your style. Some people really like ink and ink lines and other people don't. So it depends on what you enjoy. I like doing watercolor, gouache, ink, watercolor, crayon. Those are the different mediums I've settled into. I started out with just watercolor and then for a more opaque look I ventured into gouache and I did already have some ink um, background because of doing some watercolor and ink pieces uh, in a comic book style, graphic novel style. And then it sort of just turned into, um, you know, what I was looking for gouache pans, and they don't really make artist quality gouache pans. So I ended up having some opaque colors in the Schmincke watercolor line um, for, for my gouache colors, and then I also stumbled upon uh, watercolor crayons and also um, watercolor bricks made by Creta Color and um, Karen de Osh. And as a result of that, I realized that I could do a lot of cool gouache like work without having to rely on tubes because I really don't like tubes. Some people really are okay with tubes. Tubes really bother me. I hate having to squeeze them out and trying to get the last out of them and the fact that they have an expiration date. And they don't really. You can cut them open if it's watercolor and um, use it again. And just, you know, take out that little color worm that's inside of that if it's watercolor or gouache and use it again. But if, if it's acrylic or oil, you will not be able to do that. Acrylic or an oil is just going to dry in your tube and then it's gone. So I'm employing a very simple wet on wet um, with just more blending technique. As long as I put on paint that's thicker, then I can keep painting even with this paper still being wet. You're in the gaming category, so I was going to go take a look to see if I could change it to the right category. Sure. While you, while you paint so don't worry about it. Okay. How are you going to change that? 
It says how to in style. These are the problems of streaming the first time anywhere. So when we streamed the first time on um, Twitch, we had similar issues and it took us a few streams to get caught up, but I think because we've already streamed on Twitch, probably the next time I'm on YouTube, I should probably be okay, but just wanted to see um, the difference between YouTube and Twitch and see if I actually liked one over the other. Okay, so he's kind of got a little seam down the center of himself here. And it's up to you if you want to, like, do that. I mean, he might look like he's sort of been <laughs> chopped open. <laughs> he's got, like, a suture scar or something. So it all depends on how you put it in. But, I mean, he is a teddy bear, so you can sort of put it in subtly. And then go ahead and blend around it. And then we're going to, of course, have some shading underneath his bow tie and such. So... Again, see how this really just acts very much more or less like a, a watercolor that's transparent but with a little bit more body when you use it with just this amount of layering. If you keep, you know, layering it, then it's going to turn into a completely opaque gouache. But um, for right now, it's going to behave like it's a transparent watercolor with slightly more body. So, And that's how we're going to use it for this piece. So we're not going to do it opaque like we did for that bird piece that I was showing earlier. But definitely, it's nice to have tools that are super diverse that you can do other things with. So I've got my um, silver black velvet round in a two that I'm using. And I also just have a, I think this is a half inch or quarter inch uh, angle brush. That's just a Robertson and synthetic. And I tend to have a lot of these brushes on hand for simple use. But you can see how quickly you can build up some shading on this little stuffed bear. I've got a little pool of water sitting there, so sort of collecting a little puddle of water right there. Might move it off into some other part, so maybe an ear up here. I try not to move it to some place where I can't draw a hard line near the edge, because it, this color does blend, so there's not really that much of a problem. If I do form a hard line someplace, I can just soften it out, but I just prefer to try to make sure I do it that way anyway. It's just an old habit left over from working with transparent watercolor is that you basically try to soften out your edges before you leave because you may not be able to do that later. Because staining and transparent watercolors do dry with a hard edge unless you soften them. So I'm going to go ahead and come in with a, just with the rest of the paint that I can get off of this brush, like I said. Seems to be the same color in this little muzzle area, so I don't think it really matters if I come into there. Do you have a question? What kind of light do you usually paint in, natural or artificial? Oh, I, I tend to paint in natural light, and even when I have light bulbs that I have to have on for streams, I tend to use daylight bulbs. But I think natural lighting, unless you have a glare, so if you're sitting outside or near a window where there's a huge glare, it's going to give you some eye strain, but apart from that, if you're sitting someplace where there's just natural lighting without any kind of glare and overexposure, then it's really just the best lighting for your eyes and for you to be able to gauge colors. So I much prefer that to any other kind of lighting. And I do end up painting at night under daylight bulbs sometimes because, well, you just don't have a schedule to always work when you want to. So oftentimes I'll end up filming a video or uh, you know, painting at nighttime, and it does affect the lighting. It does make the lighting worse, and the color gauges are more difficult. But it's it's just what you have to do because you you know you have no other choice. But if if I had a choice, it would always be natural daytime lighting, and as a second, a distant second, daylight bulbs. So I'm going ahead and putting in more of that lighter color here. I'm going to come in with the brown, and again, this is all wet on wet, so it's creating a lovely bare feel. And I'm an artist, and I don't, I don't do any kind of stamping at all, so, but I do see that there's a lot of stamping on YouTube and a lot of stamping videos. So if you're the kind of person who does like stamping or card making, if you do a simple ink drawing like this, you always can, it can give you the feel of that. So, I mean, this is definitely a piece that can turn into a card um, without actually having the stamp. Um, one of the reasons I never became a stamper is because I, uh, from a very young age, drew a lot, so I never really felt the need to collect any stamps or anything like that, but I also feel like I like to do stuff that nobody else has, and if you 
buy stamps. It doesn't matter, um, you know, how many stamps you have. Somebody, even if you buy the, the less common ones, somebody else will have them someplace, and therefore your work will not be unique. I have another yeah. question. Mm -hmm. What color did you use on the head? On the head. It is the same exact color of watercolor crayon brown from the Karen Dosh Neo Color 2s that I have right here. It's just diluted. So this tin has the basic 12 set of Karen Dosh Neo Color 2 watercolor crayons and the basic, I think, 8 set of um, Create a Color Aqua sticks in here. And they're, they're very similar to each other. That's why I sort of just have them in little pieces in the same tin. But, um, so this brown diluted turns into that brown, and I'm actually going to make it more yellow because um, it's it's not his base color for the rest of his body, so I just wanted to use up that paint that I had down there, so I just went and spread it out there, but I do actually want to make him more of this tannish yellow. And you can see how these watercolor crayons, when they're more diluted, do look more like watercolor, and then as soon as you get them a little bit more opaque, they start to look like gouache, or um, because they are... Um, have an oil and wax binder in them. It's really cool because they also end up looking like acrylic or oil painting if you do them super thick. So it's very interesting. Um, I did another piece on YouTube at some point and I've done many. I've got a, a playlist of watercolor crayon and gouache videos, but it's really great to do uh, studies of oil paintings actually because the oil paintings don't look like they're oil paintings if you do the studies of them in watercolor, which is fine if you only use watercolor. But if you want to give them an oil or acrylic look, then watercolor crayons or gouache will do that for you because you can add that body color opacity to them. So that's, you know, something I've always found very interesting. Um, you know, I, I've loved all of this stuff for all the terms and techniques and everything, the history of all these things for many years. And again, I blame that on my background of having taught at a university for four years before I stopped to be a full-time artist and illustrator. But just the collection of information is very fascinating to me. So um, I just love how all of these different things can connect to each other, be different or similar, and love to, to share that information too. Because I do think that for some artists, I'm very visual myself, so if I see something happening, it is helpful. But as somebody who is also, you know, um, an academic um, previously, I do feel like the information helps me figure out how to remember stuff too. So I think if you have a combination of information with the visual, it's actually very useful. So to me, that's how I present my videos too. I'm going and adding that to the entire bear head now. So now he's very much the same color as the bear down there. It does look like he's got a little bit of a dark spot on this side of his eye. So I am going to it's supposed to be because I wanted to see that shadow from the photograph. It's just, it's a lighter shadow in the photograph. But I do think it sort of makes it look like you lose his, a little bit of his um, eye there. So I think I'm going to add a little bit of his eye socket by lifting it, just that paint right out right there. So that way it's more obvious where his eye starts and stops versus if we just leave that brown there. But you can see how easy it is to lift that. And unlike oil or acrylic, you can lift it after it's dry because it's got a gum arabic binder. Um, if it's gouache and it's got a combination gum arabic wax, water, water soluble wax um, binder. It's basically like if you were working with lotion is, you know, oils, uh, if you use oil paint, it's like working with some kind of thick body butter or lotion, but you can't dilute it with water because real oil doesn't dilute with water, it repels water. But what they've done with watercolor crayons and watercolor sticks and stuff is that they've actually made it so that it's kind of an emulsion, like if you're working with mayonnaise, basically. And you can dilute mayonnaise if you try. Um, I don't know why you would, but I'm saying that too as a scientific example is because it's an emulsion. It's a mixture for the molecules to be um, a mix of oil and water binding to each other. And so if you go and try to mix the, add water in them, you can do that. So that's basically what this is when you're working with a watercolor crayon. It's basically like working with paint mayo um, versus traditional oil paint, which you cannot dilute with water, which you need um, linseed oil to make it, uh, you know, just to add liquid to it, and then turpentine or some kind of uh, fumy thinner to make it thinner. So it's not going to work if you just add water. Water is just going to be repelled by the oil. Okay, so I'm coming down this side of his muzzle too. 
And I do think he's got, he had a different shadow for the muzzle in the original piece, but I'm just not going to do that because I gave him a mustache. <laughs> and as a result of that, he's not going to have the same shadows that he has in the original reference photo. And again, the reference photo is much more of a sort of guide here. You can see that I took a lot of artistic license for how I drew both of these bears and uh, the embellishments that I added. And I just thought it was a fun piece to do as a first YouTube stream because um, everybody that I know in my family got married in the spring or summer months. And so I thought it'd be nice to do this as a piece and then put it up as a print on Redbubble and then send off different cards to my brother, my sister, and to my parents because everybody that I know, and myself too, but I don't need to send a card to myself. <laughs> everybody got married in the spring or the summer, so I'm going to give him a dark brown nose and I do think he needs a little bit of shadow on the nose too so let me try to get some of the water out of it so this is not going to puddle up on the paper and I'm going to come back with a much denser version of that same paint right here so just lift it up right out of your little tin and I see that I like his shadow to be like around here on this side. Now I'm going to come back with my other brush and just tap that paint at the very edge to give me a nice margin. And it gives me a nice margin value. It gives me not just uh, two values and it also gives me a nice gradient blended edge. And you can always keep blending and smudging and working away at stuff when you do something that is wet on wet, especially if it is with a non-staining watercolor, gouache, watercolor crayon, or, um, you know, um, I guess oil pastels that are water soluble will fall into the same category. It won't work with staining watercolor or with uh, ink. You can, of course, blend staining watercolor and ink, but you've got a much more limited time to do that. Okay, I'm going to darken up his mustache a bit more. I had to give him a mustache because... My father-in-law had a mustache and my own father had a mustache when they were married. So I figured that mustaches may not be all the rage right now, but they certainly were for my dad when he was getting married in the 70s. So. And I'll give him a little bit of shadow up there for his ears and coming along quite nicely. The other thing I knew about uh, or I heard about YouTube is that if it's more than an hour long on a stream you can't edit the stream afterward which I find really irritating because I like to edit dead spots out of stuff. I like my videos to be really uh, condensed and sort of informative without having any dead spots. So what I'll probably do is if I don't take down the stream, if I leave it up and you want to watch the full length that's fine, well, I'll probably also upload a sped up condensed version that gives you um, with a new voiceover the information and the techniques um, for this video because that way if you don't want to watch it for however much time it takes then you can also not have to worry about watching it with all of the all the little dead spots and whatever it is that, that it takes in real time but some people find real time painting to be very relaxing so if you want to watch it in real time then please do just an option for other people Okay. It's funny how much more the mustache ages him. <laughs> I'm going to add a little seam here and a little seam here because, like I said, he's a teddy bear and I see that. I feel like it makes him look too angry or weird. I will lift it out. And that's the, the good thing about watercolor that's uh, opaque if it's a gouache. But I think I can leave a very subtle amount of it there without it being too much. I do think it sort of makes it look makes him look like you've got angry brow lines, so I think I'll just leave it very subtle. So that's that part of it, and a little bit more shadow in his ears. But I've done so many bears and bunnies on this channel now, I didn't even know I liked bears and bunnies that much. I guess they just make good stream stuff and there's a lot of reference stock for them. I like real bears and I like real bunnies, but I didn't know I liked teddy bears as much as I did until I started doing this channel. Okay, so over or my live streams, I should say, because this channel is, uh, my YouTube channel of the live stream is, the, this is the first one today, but my channel is, uh, I think, two years old. Two years old for video posting. 
a little bit older than that for since when I've had an account, but I haven't really posted very, very much. I only started posting within the last year or two. Um, okay, so I've gotten all of that done, and I do think he needs uh, a little bit more. His highlights and his eyes need to maybe be a little bit brightened up, but um, not necessarily too much, just a little bit of a tad here and there. I did do that with white. Uh, I left the white of the paper there, but sometimes the white of the paper is not enough in size, so you can go and increase the size. So I've done that. Now we can do this little bow, and we can move on. And if anybody has any questions, just let me know. It's basically the same as Twitch, I guess. Feels very similar to Twitch. <laughs> okay, so I think his bow tie in the in the reference photo is black. Um, my opinion is is that it's a little bit too not colorful for a reference photo that I'm using as you know I'm applying some artistic license to. So I think I'm probably going to give him a, a pink or a red bow tie, maybe even a red violet one, maybe just a nice red one. Because I feel like the black is not wedding festive enough, definitely for a teddy bear. A teddy bear would never wear a black bow tie to his own wedding. It doesn't make any sense. Maybe a grizzly would, but not a teddy bear. Okay, hold on. Okay, so let me see if I can increase the quality of, um, you see the screen's a little bit darker. Let me just take a quick second to increase the contrast or the lighting of my screen here real quick. And hopefully that'll help with stuff showing up a little bit better on screen. Okay, so I think that's what I'll do. Okay, and has it brightened a bit now? Can you see it brighter? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just let me know. It's It will be a little bit washed out, but at least it won't be as, um, um, you know, like I said, it won't be as dark. You don't want it to be dark versus that. It's gonna, like I said, it takes, it's weird because on the camera it looks super bright, but sometimes it doesn't look like that on the stream. So maybe they like reduce the, the stream light or something? I don't know. Ava says much beater. <laughs> much beater? Well, thanks Ava. I, I, was, I love you. Thanks for showing up. I guess today I'd have to say I love you more than I can bear. <laughs> and yes, you can put one of those little sentiments on this piece if you wanted to. Like, very nice to have you, or love you more than I can bear, or whatever it is. But I'm going to leave mine without any kind of uh, text, because I put it up as a print, and people can write stuff on it, or maybe inside the card if they get it as a print from um, Redbubble. But it doesn't, it doesn't have to have that on the actual art, unless it's a print. So. so I'm actually, that little tiny area is not doing what I want it to do. So I'm just going to go ahead and make it all dark. And then I'm going to take the edge here and lift um, up a highlight from the very edge here. And I'm just using a very dry, damp brush to lift up my highlight. And once it dries, I can come back and adjust it further. And I'm going to skip a section of this bow tie because I should. Otherwise, it'll blend into the upper section. And instead of applying this wet on wet, I'm just going to do this wet on dry. Because when you get to these teenier sections, if you want the control, then you really have to operate wet on dry. And um, you'll get more magical blends and effects if you do wet on wet. But as soon as you need more control in tiny areas, then you want to do wet on dry. And for your final details, which should be very minimal, um, when it comes to um, a watercolor piece, unless it's inked or something, you can do dry brush. But dry brush can look scratchy, so try to make sure that if you're doing dry brush that 
It's uh, just for very small like embellishments like the stamens off of a flower or something like that, you know, teeny tiny whiskers or something, some such thing, but I tend to be okay with uh, wet on dry. I don't really have to head towards dry brush land until the very end. And in this piece, you won't have to do that anyway because it's been inked. So if you did, if you had an ink, if you have an ink piece, you have all these outlines. In which case, you don't need to sharpen anything up unless you want to re-ink some of your lines. But if you had a sans ink piece that only was operating off of watercolor, you might need to apply some teeny details or fine bits in, uh, in some dry brush. So that's what that's for. But watercolor is really good for detail if you use it in dry brush. Same thing for gouache and same thing for ink. You just have to make sure you're doing it on dry paper with a thicker paint. So that's this little bow tie coming along. And I don't really feel like it's necessary to make it exactly, again, like it is in the reference photo, because we've already inked this piece and we've changed the color and I've sort of drawn in slightly different lines for where I was doing that, but I'm just giving it uh, a similar look and just need some highlights someplace to make it look like he's got some little creases in his bow. And when it comes to his center of his bow, we've got this part here is the darkest. And I'm going to come back and apply that line again. And it's up to you. You could make it so that another part is the darkest. But once you do that, you have to make a decision as to where to head your highlight off on. So I'm going to choose the bottom to be giving me a little bit of a reflective highlight. Right there. And I'm going to come back in at the very bottom. This brush has a fine tip. And get that bit because of course this is fabric and not some kind of metal. So you wouldn't have a, a sharp highlight heading all the way down to the bottom like that. Unless it was like some glass or metal surface. Coming back up near the top, and I want to get a highlight in the center of that section too. And you don't have to labor over this. You can make it just a simple bow tie with no highlights or just one highlight, but I like doing details, so it's whatever makes you feel happy and comfortable. And I did forget to record this, so I'm going to have to, I don't know if I don't think I get it off of the stream, I guess I could download it off of YouTube. You can start now. Yeah, I guess I could start now. So let me... What are they going to decide? Yeah, uh, they're going to decide on the beginning of the bear. So I'm just going to start recording it off of my camera now. And that's fine. Record. I like to have uh, the camera recorded version of it versus the live stream footage because something happens with the live stream footage off of YouTube and off of Twitch where they record it for you and you can download it and then use it, but only like in an emergency because the footage really isn't as good as what you can record with your camera. All these dumb things <laughs> that we didn't want to learn that now I know about live streaming. feel like we've gotten to the point in technology where YouTube should just do all of it for me. Why do I have to do any of this at all? YouTube should focus it for me, get the right footage, get the right exposure. Same thing for Twitch. Like, when are you guys gonna up your game, man? This is totally not the right way to be operating in 2017. I was away for the last two weeks uh, visiting my parents. Um, I actually said they were visiting me before I left on my last stream, but that's only because I didn't want them to be like robbed while I was gone. But so when I'm in the future, you won't believe me, and maybe I'll get robbed anyway. But um, I was down in Southern California visiting my parents for two weeks, and now I'm finally back up, and I'm doing an extra stream this week because I stream on Thursdays on Twitch. Twitch is my Thursday. Um, live stream day, so I have been doing that for, like I said, some few months now, and it's been a lot of fun, but I don't uh, 
ever stream on YouTube, so I thought I needed to do an extra stream this week just to feel, because I was feeling sort of antsy from not having streamed for a while and posted anything for a while. So I thought, okay, I'll try YouTube this time around and I'll do it for my extra stream. So it turns out to be totally bogus. It can just be like the extra stream for this week. So that's what today is, and that's why we're also not using, we're not doing the Mooka piece. Um, we're not doing the nice Versailles realism Art Nouveau piece that we were doing last time. But that's okay too. It's stressful enough to, like I said, to be starting streaming a, on a new channel, to, on a new website and everything without having to do a complicated piece while you're doing it. So there's always the future for that. We've worked our way up to that on, straight on uh, streaming on Twitch too, which is like, done various difficulty pieces on Twitch and that's good for my viewers and it's also good for me because variety is the spice of life. You don't want to always do everything in the same style or the same amount of difficulty. At least I don't. Diane said that she's glad you got some family time but uh, she missed your streams. So oh. never ever go on vacation again. Okay. <laughs> I'll make sure I do that. They can visit me. That's what I told them last time. If they visited me I wouldn't have had to stop streaming. And when I was down there, I missed streaming too. I missed you guys too. You guys are like, without, um, you know, you guys appreciate me posting my art videos and teaching this stuff. I appreciate you guys being like my art group therapy almost. It's like, it's a lot of fun to see you guys every week. I see a lot of the same people. And I really appreciate the repeat viewers especially because I feel like I kind of get to know you and your comments after a while and everything. So it, it was just, it was a... It was difficult not to, I didn't realize I was going to have such a hard time, like, because I've never streamed before uh, this year. So once I did start streaming, I'm surprised how quickly I've gotten used to it as a thing that I like to do and don't want to stop. Um, it makes it sound like I'm addicted, <laughs> like it's turning into a problem that I should take care of. But um, but no, it's, it was, it's a lot of fun to, to do all these uh, streams and I missed you guys a lot too. And my parents, uh, God bless them, they're nice people, but boy, they can be uh, stressful, and also they are not very artsy, you know? So I've tried to make them do adult coloring books, I've tried to make them do painting classes with me, or just little projects and stuff. They're not interested in any of that stuff, and I always meet people, like, in my real art classes, whether it was when I taught university and, you know, college-age students, or whenever I'm teaching classes in art center for some older age students and people are like, oh, your parents must be so lucky because they get to get like firsthand classes from you. I'm like, uh, no, because they don't want to do these classes and they don't want to do any kind of art. So that's kind of sad for me when I go down there. I'm like, hey, you guys want to do something artistic and fun and like paint something and make something? And my mom's like, are we going to use it for something at the end? Does it have a purpose? I'm like, it's art. That's the purpose. <laughs> and so she's like, no, not really. So that's why I also do different kinds of art that makes my parents, uh, makes my mom happy and want to do it too. So I also do embroidery and sewing and stuff like that. So I did do some embroidery while I was down there just for fun because I wanted to do something artistic and, I thought, and I've ended up doing embroidery and sewing as a result for my whole life because that's something my mom does appreciate is if she's got something pretty sitting around and I can make it prettier um, or something plain sitting around that I can spice up with some embroidery or fabric painting, she's totally willing to do that. Or she's willing to have me make some jewelry for her and, you know, buy, like, little gemstones and silver stuff and do some jewelry for her. That's totally okay. But when it comes to a painting, she doesn't get it and neither does my dad. I mean, they're more than happy to hang stuff up on their wall and stuff, but they feel like they're not going to spend the time, like, seeing it made and stuff. So they don't get the same feeling that I do, which is I love painting. And I also love watching people paint. So I can just watch art videos and it calms me down. I think that's why I watch other people's art videos. It's like, oh, this is so soothing. <laughs> okay, so I've got um, most of this bear done. He looks totally like he's from the 70s. He just needs my dad's sideburns and my dad's sort of like Fonzie collar and pants and everything. And he'd totally be like my dad getting married in the 70s in a powder blue suit. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on to the little lady bear on this side. And I'm trying to figure out what color here I want my little lady bear to be. Um, uh, I feel like, you know, I'm an international history grad student, so I got my master's in international history, and unfortunately I'm thinking, like, all the color complicated, like, all the sort of subtext of, like, different colors here. You know, it has nothing to do with these stupid bears, but I'm thinking, can't make her lighter because there's subtext there, I can't make her this or that or whatever, you know, and it's like, 
This is just a bear. It has nothing to do with race relations. Um, okay, so let's see. And by the way, I'm totally for all sorts of race relations. So that's my point on it. I just didn't want to make her lighter because I'd make it look like... Never mind. I'm not going there. Um, okay, so let's see. I'm trying to figure out um, what color, what color. They seem to have very limited colors here when it comes to normal teddy bear colors. I could make her like totally wrong, like purple, and she'd be like a teddy bear from space, but I don't feel like it would make it so that her little piece, headpiece and pearls and everything would look very good. So my assumption is, is I'm going to make her a earth tone teddy bear Somebody's piece. Somebody's voting for pink. A pink bear? Another vote is for don't overthink it. <laughs> Everybody else has left while you talk to yourself about the color of your bear. They have. I'm sorry. I scared people away talking about the color of this bear. Um, I'd say, how about a brownish, a, a yellow brownish pink? I don't know if I can make much of a, it's going to make a lot of her flowers pink, but um, I do think, I do think I can make her. Now there's a vote for blonde. Blonde. I like blonde, especially because it's like literally right here, it's sitting right here. So blonde it is, and I will give her lots of, I'll give her, instead of giving her a white veil and all this stuff like that, I'll give her more of a pinky veil so that we get pink too, and that'll also satisfy the don't overthink it because we're moving on. Um, okay, so now she's just a blonde bear. How's that? And again, we want to use a lot of water. Now um, that you've chosen blonde, the channel has settled on mint. Mint? So make sure to get some mint in there somewhere. Okay, yeah, I like mint. I love pistachio and mint. I've got pistachio and mint furniture, too. I also wanted pistachio-colored and mint-colored uh, kitchen cabinets, but when we moved in, the people said that we only had the choice between white and brown. And I was like, what? And we can pay for other colors. And they were like, no, that's just all the colors we do. And so I had to get white cabinets. Because then at least I could feel like there was more of an artistic base for that because I was tired of getting cherry-colored cabinets. I've seen them in my mom's house for eons now, so I did not want to get cherry-colored cabinets. And I think your mom has blonde-colored wood, doesn't she? Yeah, so I always had to be like some other color than that, as much as I like their cabinets, but... And I should mention that the fact that she's a blonde bear has absolutely nothing to do with her being better than if she had been a brunette bear or an ebony bear or any other kind of hair colored bear. So she is the same as as far as equality goes for any kind of bear. And I don't really know if this means that she's got this colored skin or hair or he's got brown hair or brown skin. I can't tell. I mean I guess they're just fur. I don't know what color what color that's supposed to be. I guess you're drawing this card for, for people that you know. And if somebody is a brunette or a redhead, then you could make the bear red, and then you can make the other person, you know, like if the guy has dark brown hair or black hair or whatever, blonde hair, then you could you could sort of color coordinate the bears like that um, to make their hair match the hair color of their head. Um, you could also make it so that it matches something else, like their favorite color or whatnot. So, I mean, there's different ways to color coordinate if you did a piece like this. But we didn't have any, um, you know, sort of really... If I wanted to do this, then this bear, I have black hair, so the bear would be a black bear, and um, Elijah's bear would have brown hair, so. So blonde is basically the furthest away from my hair color, basically. It's like the polar opposite, but I like how, I like the idea of how it fits into the color scheme, so. I don't think it would have made a, it's a harder bear to do if you do a black bear, let me just put it that way, because uh, the colors are going to be a little bit more difficult to harmonize with a wedding scheme, but I think if you went for a blue black or a purplish black, that would work. So if you do want to do that, that's the way to do it. Don't go for like a gray black, because when you dilute it, it'll just be carbon black dilutes down to more of a gray black. So even though it is more blue toned than um, ivory black and carbon black do have a sort of more neutral tone to them. But, like I said, I don't think that says. Okay, so instead of using this brown for her shadows, I'm going to use now this tan for her shadow. Because that's then her base color is the other one. I don't think we painted it, it in wet enough for it to do wet, to wet blends. So, I'm going to have to do the blends in a different way. So, let's hope that they work. Yeah, see that's going on wet on dry basically. 
So what we're going to do is just do the block coloring for where I want it, and then I'm going to soften out the edge with uh, the other brush. And that's the other way to do uh, blended edges, is to end up doing it on a dry background, and you can do that. And because this is watercolor crayon, it leaves a little bit of an imprint in the shadowed area, and that's perfectly fine for a bear's fuzzy fur. If you wanted to do this for a human being, then you'd want to do it very flat and very with thin paint if you were working with watercolor crayon, or super opaque paint. So again, you can make it very flat. One, one side of the spectrum or the other if you're using watercolor crayon for human skin. Because if you use it in the middle, the little blotchiness that looks great for fur, it's not going to look so great for human beings. So. so you can see how the tan makes a great sort of monochromatic shadow. So you can also add, if you don't have more than a few colors, you can always add burnt sienna to any color to give it more value range. So if I didn't have a tan, I could add burnt sienna to my yellow, to my blonde color, and that would give it a darker value range for whatever purposes I needed it for, like shadows. You can also use the complementary color. That's the classic way of adding in a shadow. So yellow's opposite is purple, so I could come in with a a purple and it would sort of mix into a little bit of a brown on the yellow blonde fur. So that's the other way to do it. I don't really care to add a cooler purple to this bear because we're keeping it very sort of warm and earthy as a teddy bear, but I mean, definitely using complementary colors gives you more of a temperature range than using monochromatic value shading, which is what I'm doing here. I don't know what it's like for you guys wherever you are, but in California there is a heat wave. There is a heat wave in Southern California when I visited there, and there is a heat wave in Northern California when I've come back up here. So there is a heat wave everywhere. Heat wave everywhere. I forgot to do this little top muzzle shading part on the bear to the left. So I'll probably go back and do that. It does add a little bit of distance to the front and back part of the muzzle, just in a sort of cartoony way. And it's cute, so you want to make sure that we add that in. But yeah, I don't know how it ended up happening that I did this many bears. It's really turning into a thing. Bears and bunnies. But we also do a lot of, uh, like I said, realism pieces. If you've been keeping up with any of my streams or my other videos, I would suggest you check out my Blue Veil video um, that was done with watercolor crayons and gouache. And it is a realism piece that's based off of a painting called The Blue Veil by Henry Tarbell that I saw at the De Young um, Fine Arts Museum in San Francisco near where I live. And because um, I'm very lucky to live and to have been raised in California and um, been here my whole life and enjoyed the diversity and also the great facilities for arts and everything. And that includes the art museums. And so I saw this piece and I wanted to do a study of it, but I don't do oil painting, so I did it in uh, watercolor crayon and gouache. And if you want to see something more realistic, then check out the Blue Veil, uh, my version of it on my channel on YouTube. And you can also check out uh, the other things in the playlist for gouache and watercolor crayons. But there's definitely a mix of intermediate and uh, easy and complicated. Oops, she doesn't have any brown in her. She's got blonde and tan. So I'm just going to lift this right up and it's gone because it's watercolor crayon or gouache. So that works very easily. Going back to doing the tan on her. And I think some of her shadows need to be a bit darker, but she's going to have a little bit more of a value range issue than he does because the tan is a lot lighter than what we've got um, on the left here for the other bear. So I'm just going to try to use this denser. The other option is to come back with more layers, but since I want to do this on stream and finish, um, I'm going to try to use it just denser. And I did draw this up and took some time drawing it up before I got um, streaming and I also inked it with the marker. Um, you don't have to um, do the inking, like I said, it's up to you. And I also could have done the inking on the stream, but I figured that you guys would want to see something a little bit more interesting. So I try to get into the colors as soon as possible, and given how we had a little bit of hiccups, I'm glad we did, because otherwise we might still be inking. OK, 
okay? And just got a little bit of shadow on this side too. Come back onto that side. And this is, for me, the easiest way to paint realism or even semi-realism because we can pretend that this is still semi-realistic because um, I'm doing teddy bears, but I'm doing them with values. There's still some value shading going on. And depending on how much I wanted to push it, like say there was no ink lines, I can make them more realistic. Um, say I wanted to add really tiny textures and shading, then it would make it more realistic. But if you have two brushes, one to put the color down with and the other to blend out edges with, that's really how I found it to be the easiest for blending and applying paint when it comes to values. It's not, I don't, I've never seen anybody else do it, so uh, I don't know how many other people might do it, but I know that it's uh, something that I like to do is have to work with more than one brush at the same time. And this part back there is her little blonde head that I missed in between those pearls. So I'm going to go back and add that as soon as I'm done shading part for some of her ears. And I left it zoomed out because I guess you guys typically like me to be zoomed out. I always like to be zoomed in so people can see the close-up of what I'm painting. And then typically most people want me to zoom out so they can see more of the piece even if it's further away. So I sort of learned to leave it zoomed out most of the time because I found that that's what people like. But that's why you're not seeing that close up. I'm going to use a little bit of this little yellowish blonde here to come back in. And that's a little bit yellower. You're two minutes away from one hour, by the way. Oh, am I? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think we're going to stop at one hour, though. It doesn't seem like it. Seems like uh, we're going to be here for two hours, just like my other streams. I, I don't think I can ever do a stream that's one hour unless it's really, really, really easy a piece because I told myself I was going to do this piece today and it would be finished in an hour because I'd make it really easy, the line art. And it could have been finished in an hour, but then I decided to make the shading a little bit more difficult. So then it sort of worked itself back up to two hours. So I can't seem to wrap up pieces much faster. I think it's because I always paint more complicated than I plan. Uh, than, I, than I tell myself I should on a live stream. But, so my live streams always end up being about two hours. And that means I'm not going to be able to edit this on YouTube. This is just going to be up in its entirety on YouTube. And then the edited version, once I have it up, I'll either take this version down or make it private or something, I don't know, unless you guys really like to see the real-time version and I'll, then I'll leave it up there, I guess. I just hate all the sort of, I'm kind of a, a neat freak even when it comes to my videos, so I like over edit all my videos and make sure there's no gaps and you know, speed stuff up and give all the relevant information. I've got a really short attention span, so my assumption is that other people do too. You have a question from Mint Moths asking if you ever work with acrylics. I have worked with acrylics in the past. I've done some large canvas paintings. Um, I've also painted furniture in acrylic, and I don't like the feel of it. Um, it is literally a, a, a liquid plastic. Um, it's an acrylic polymer, and I don't like the plasticky, sort of filmy feel of it. Um, I much prefer how watercolor or gouache um, feel, and also ink and watercolor crayon as similar water media, but one of the few water media that I don't like really is uh, um, acrylic. I just, I, I do fabric painting and that also has a acrylic paint type paint when you do that. And it's just something that I do when I do um, furniture painting, fabric painting, or some canvas style painting, but I don't really like the feel of it for doing complicated paintings. I feel like the paint handles in a much creamier way, in a much silkier way, when it has a gum arabic binder, like in watercolor and gouache. And versus uh, acrylic, which has that plastic polymer binder. So, but I mean, it's definitely something I've done, and it's similar. Um, it's got more versatility, definitely, in some ways, because it means you can work in thin glazes and also thick paint, and you can come back after it's dried and work over it. But I think if you use a combination of the stuff that I do, you can sort of get a mix of it. But I mean. Obviously acrylic can also be worked opaque, like oil and gouache, whereas watercolor and ink cannot. And watercolor and ink, um, you know, also, and gouache as well, have some lifting going on versus 
acrylic, which dries permanently like oil. So there are convenience and versatility factors to be had when it comes to painting with um, acrylic. So that's something you have to ask yourself is how much do you enjoy having that all in one medium versus spreading it around if you are using something that has less chemicals and handles creamier and smoother and silkier than because I prefer the, the handling and the low chemical cost of the watercolor gouache paints instead. Because there is a unfortunate, um, you know, there's there is a chemical cost to that. But also, if you're allergic to things, you know, even if you're not doing it for environmental reasons, the other reason is that you might be allergic to it. So I, I can't really smell acrylic paints for a long time. I end up getting a cold from them too, so... To, and like oil paints make me really sick. Not the actual oil paints, but the thinner, uh, the turpentine or anything, you know, uh, even the the uh, the less uh, fumy ones, like you know, turpoint or whatever. They they're just not any good for for me. Liquid and everything, they're not good for me. Um, so I just stick with these uh, the media that have, that works for me as far as allergies. So that's watercolor gouache, ink, and watercolor cream. And watercolor crayon is basically like gouache, but with some oil in it, so it's very similar. If you have that, there's no reason to get both. I just ended up with both because I refused to get gouache tubes. Okay, so... She got a little forearms right here. And I'll try to move him further back onto the screen so you can compare. So again, he was done all wet on wet because I so thoroughly wet him with water before we even started painting that it really kept it um, very wet even when I was doing the second layer. And that helps because then you don't have to blend out any of the edges manually. With this, I'm coming back and manually having to soften and blend out edges. So if you forget to do that, then you'll have to do it manually. It does give you a little bit more control, but for a watercolor crayon, there really isn't any there's not a huge loss of control. It's not like watercolor where things bleed more. Gouache and watercolor crayon are more opaque, so they tend to have a heavier density to them, and they don't really flow as fast or as much as watercolor or ink. So you're not going to have as much loss of control with them because they're just thicker paints that go down thicker and work thicker and everything. So. I did make my bear a little bit um, cuter around the nose and mouth and gave her eyes with eyelashes and stuff. So you might again notice that it's just up to you for the artistic license that you want to use to do whatever it is that you want to do for your bear. Now that part there is all darker so I'm just going to go ahead and put it in as darker. It's the shadow going into her little arms there and she's holding a little bouquet that she's holding. It's less of a bouquet and more of a sort of little nosegay or sprig of flowers actually, but I guess it's all she could afford because she's just a teddy bear. Or maybe her sister Selma was in charge of the flowers and Selma's been holding a grudge since high school and so as a result of that she got her like a really bad bouquet of flowers. Um, I can't think of what else would have made it so that you have such a tiny bouquet of flowers on your wedding day. That's why you should always do everything yourself. Don't leave your flowers in charge of your sister or somebody else unless they're like really super dependable because they'll totally screw it up. Yeah, I have like sound really bitter. There's reasons. I won't go into them. <laughs> I have my reasons. Okay, so... There we go, that's uh, that part of it, and also that little curve there again going in there can just be all done dark and it can just disappear into a little dark bundle of her arms there, and do the same thing on this side, heading out from her little teddy bear lack of fingers or whatever that end of her, her arm is. And I'd like to put a little bit of shading here just to sort of give it a little bit of a block to the end of her arms there because I feel like there's hardly any shading there. She didn't really have the kind of 
seams. I didn't really like what the seams did with them, so I stopped doing the seams. And like I said, it does sort of look more like a a suture line, you know, when you're doing it as a drawing. And um, you'd have to probably do it differently. I mean, I did like how it ended up for the belly, so I could go ahead and blend it out a little bit and just make that into a shading there. But again, there's going to be quite a bit of dark on her belly, too, because the belly is just... Um, a lot of shadow from him on the left and from her arms being crossed over her. So she's actually got way more shadow if you're checking out the reference photo. Did you get a chance to paste the reference photo link in the chat box? That, um, I don't know if you can or... No, it's just like Twitch where you have to be an administrator to post links. So we'll have to put it in. Oh, okay. So sure. next time around. Okay. Yeah, if you, but if you go to graphicsdoc.com and search for wedding bears you will see these bears but that's if you want to compare and contrast what i'm painting again i can't show their photo because you can only use their reference photos if you like paint them or significantly change them so they they're not you're not allowed to even if you have a subscription like me to actually show their their photos uh the way that you see them online so but if you go and look search for that you'll see it anyway if you search for Wedding bears off of graphicstock.com on the search bar for graphicstock.com when you get to that main page. Okay, so that's that, and let me add just a teeny bit of more shadow right there because it seems to be lightening up. But she's coming along pretty well. And again, her feet are not going to be that dark. They're sort of in the photo, much more sort of in a highlighted area than the rest of the body. So my assumption is, is that they sort of should contrast against the rest of the, the teddy bear that is further away. So I'm just going to make them not very dark, especially at the top border that matches with, uh, meets up with the rest of the bear. So I'll just make it darker down here where it's heading into the little scout bin. Again, I changed the basket into a scout bin. It's just a a quick change that you can do uh, to make it more your own and also I didn't like I said I didn't really like the look of the woven basket so I thought a bin would be better and guess what color we can make the bin we can make it mint colored that would be lovely um, okay I was also gonna do some lace work on the actual bin with some gel pen now we get to do the funnest part for me just like the bow was really fun um, I love doing the embellishment parts of it so now we've gotten to the, the bin and the little fascinator and stuff. So here we are. Um, let's do the, let's do our little stem and bouquet first. And we're going to make sure to add at least uh, a few of the dark red, either in the flowers or something someplace, because it has to match up with the groom a bit. The, the groom that has that maroonish red bow tie that I chose to do. So we want to make sure that that shows up someplace um, in the little bridal bride bear, because it also showed up in the in the groom. Okay, so let's do the leaves first. Now it's kind of hard to tell where some of these leaves are based on how I did my ink drawing, but I'm going to just assume that. Uh, they are where I want them to be. So if it was supposed to be a bud before and I feel like it's gonna be a leaf now, then it just is. And by the way, this is opaque. Um, the way that we're doing it, it's going to be opaque and semi-opaque. So you are gonna to have to make the decision to re-ink the bear in some parts or all of it. It's totally up to you. I only choose to do some parts of it. I actually like how it fades, um, makes stuff a little bit softer and smudgier. So anytime I've done that in the past, I've only re-inked parts of it. Um, it's up to you to re-ink re all of it or even ink it last. I don't prefer to ink it last because I feel like sometimes you can really lose your pencil line even when you're painting with gouache. So I prefer to ink it even if I'm going to ink it again, but I don't ever really end up re-inking the whole thing. It's only like where I feel like it really needs it. I hope you guys had a good past two weeks and did some art while you were while I was away from live streaming. I did post two videos that I pre-recorded before I left, but they're an ATC 
haul uh, showing all the different kinds of ATCs, which are artist trading cards that um, I bought on different kinds of paper. So I bought all the different kinds of artist trading cards that you can get on Strathmore or Crescent paper, and then I posted them, and it was um, posted what I got. I also got some. So there was like everything from cardstock to acrylic paper to illustration board and canvas paper and just all sorts of different kinds of um, paper that came in the assorted pack. And it was only like two bucks a piece or four bucks a piece, depending on which pack I got. So I think I'm going to cut my own artist trading cards from Arches watercolor paper because it's the best paper. But just for fun, I got the assorted packs this time. So it was just a, a fun thing for, for me to do um, as far as making a, a cheap purchase, but something that lets me sort of explain to people how different papers behave, because I did see how they had a lot of assorted papers in those packs, and thought it'd be fun to see how different media react to those papers. So I posted a video on that. I'll do projects on those papers in the future. And I also posted um, the gouache and watercolor crayon bird that we did off of a uh, Twitch live stream a few weeks back, I think, like before I left, basically. So that's also two things, but I didn't, like I said, a chance to do any kind of line streams. Okay, so I think we'll make her flowers this um, bow tie red, because I'm going to make her veil pink. I'm going to make the, the bin a minty color, and I'm going to make the pearls probably also a minty color, so there's the color in more than one place. And I'll make this little spray of stuff, either pink or the dark red, or maybe a mixture of both. So, and like I said, this is like the, the fun part. This is like the embellishment part of everything. And it's actually the easier part for this piece. For some pieces, it turns out to be it's the harder part, uh, depending on how much detail you need and what you're doing. But for this piece, because these bears are not very detailed themselves, the this part of it is just basically going to be the single, single color drop-ins for this stuff. You can always go back in and add a little bit of shadow to some of these leaves or flowers, but probably for the purposes of the stream, I'm not going to do that. I'm probably just going to leave it. You have a few new people if you want to explain to them what the uh, materials are that you're using. Okay, so um, today I'm working with watercolor crayon in my Moleskine watercolor journal, and also I it was over an inked drawing that I did in my Zig Writer in chocolate, I believe this color is, and this is a waterproof pigment-based archival marker, and so I did that. I have it in brown, a lighter brown and black, and it's very useful for inked pieces if you want just a fine line that's waterproof. So in the past we've done more complicated watercolor crayon or gouache pieces. I was talking about this bird that we did on Twitch two weeks ago, right before I left. And you can see the difference with gouache and watercolor crayon when you use it very opaquely and a little bit lighter and more sort of um, less realistic, you know, it just, but it behaves similarly in that it's opaque and how it reacts and it's not super transparent and luminous. And so we're doing these simple little bears because it was my first stream off of YouTube and um, I've been on Twitch for since, uh, uh, for a few months now and I've had YouTube as a channel, um, you know, my, as a watercolor channel on YouTube. I've had it for like two years or so, but I've never streamed on here. So I wanted to do an easy stream. So we're doing these two little bears that are obviously getting married, um, unless they are dressed up for Halloween, but I'm assuming they're getting married. So that, that's them. We did a uh, Neocolor 2 uh, watercolor crayons by, and also, um, what is it? The, Create a color aqua sticks. Those are the little colors that I have dropped into here. I just cut off little pieces from the crayons using an X-Acto knife and put them into a travel tin. And it's a great way to travel and do watercolor or gouache or watercolor crayon painting. It's just to put it in a little mint box and then get little brushes. And then you can take a journal this size or even smaller. Like I have a journal that's basically half this size, also by Moleskine, and it works great. So it's a lot of fun. Okay, so I'm gonna go and take the same little red um, sprigs that I have down here and also put them up into her little spray up here. And again, it's going to coordinate with his little tie and that's why I wanted to use the same sort of maroony red. And I don't think her sister Selma was in charge of this fascinator and veil because it turned out so well. So I think the it was only the bouquet that 
ended up not having enough flowers in it that this bear's sister took care of otherwise. Thank God she did the veil herself because she really was looking forward to having a really nice veil and fascinator for her wedding. And because she took the time to figure it out herself, it worked out all right. And those little reds are hardly going to show up because it's just a tiny area here. And I am painting them on uh, wet on dry. And if any place is, um, if it weeds out of any place, because this is watercolor crayon, you can sort of lift it up with a damp brush and scoot away at it. Um, it's not staining like watercolor, transparent watercolor that's more tr conventional or like ink. So it's much more readily lift. So it does allow you to correct, but it does give you some challenges in layering. So you have to figure out different ways to deal with it when you layer. You can layer, of course, you just have to do it differently and less easily than when you do it in watercolor or ink. So we're almost done with the little spray coming off of her little bridal veil there. And again, this is just something that I popped in, was not in the actual reference. And again, you have the artistic license to do it however you want. Nobody can tell you how to do something when it comes to embellishments and stuff. It's all up to you. Okay, so I'm gonna do the bin in mint and then I'm going to do um, the veil in pink and the pearls probably also in mint. So let's do the pearls first because I'm excited about the mintiness of them. And I think this is more like gonna be, hold on, let's see, let's find. It's gonna be more like a dusty mint, and that's totally okay. And that's almost a little bit too, too close to the green that is in the, the little flower stem. So I'm going to lift it just a bit and then come back with more of a mintier, more of a blue, I guess. I guess because it's reading less as um, mint and more of as a light green. I'm going to add more blue to it. So it's probably going to end up being like a dusty blue mint color instead of it being a true green mint. But you can always go back on top of it and make it more green. Just didn't want it to look too much like the, the leaves. But see how easily that goes on because it's so opaque and sort of chalky got a velvety feel to it. That's how gouache and watercolor crayon work, is that they've got a lov lovely sort of velvety matte texture to them and very non-reflective. Um, watercolor crayon will be reflective at a certain angle because it's got wax in it, but they both have a lovely way of going down on the paper in the first few layers. Um, but when you do too many layers for watercolor crayon, it can give you a little bit of a wax resist. That's not something that happens with gouache, so if that's something you have a problem with, then stick to gouache versus the watercolor crayon. And I'm just um, shaving off some of the overrun out of these pearls, and I guess they're sort of, like I said, minty, bordering on more blue, but I kind of like them that way, and I'm going to come back in and give them a little bit of a highlight. You can do this with the white that's in the set of colors that you have, but you can also use a white gel pen. It's depending on how fine you can get your gel pen to work. So I'm just doing a, a highlight on either end for some of those pearls. And you can sort of decide how you like the highlights. Um, I might actually shift the highlights later if I don't like them. You can, this, this gel pen is actually water soluble. It's not permanent, so you can blend edges with it and you can also erase it by lifting it off with a wet brush. So I kind of don't know exactly where I want my highlights just yet. So I've sort of changed them as I've gone around. And I think once I decide where I want them later on, I can sort of be more decided about it. But right now, I'm just going to throw them in. And this is a not realistic piece, so even if the highlights are not perfectly matched up, it's not really such a big deal.
I haven't got a chance to really look at my comments, but I see some really fun comments there. Oh, if you got married on the beach. That's so much fun. Beach weddings sound like they're super, super fun and just low-key and beautiful without any of the stress. Okay, so let me go ahead and figure out what I want for the veil now. And I think we're going to do a uh, pink because that was the request. And I think in order to do that, we can take, um, we can do it two ways. We can do a cool red, which is what I prefer to do, and then just keep it so thin that it gives us a highlight. And that way we don't have to use any white. Um, apart from where we're doing the like highlights and the eyes are on the pearls because that will make it a lot quicker than if we head towards um, doing highlights uh, with white. And I think it will make it look a little bit less diaphanous too. I mean it's much more sort of transparent looking if you do your highlights using the white of the paper versus um, using white opaque gouache and titanium white or in, even in the less opaque Chinese white. It's still an opacifying color that sort of dulls the paper. So, But you can see here how because this isn't transparent watercolor, when you use it super transparently, if you see it close up, and I don't know how much of that is obvious in the stream, but when you see it close up, it doesn't have the beauty of transparent watercolor because the pigments aren't ground as fine and it's supposed to be meant to be used thicker. Wash and watercolor crayon are both meant to be used thicker. And they look best when they are thicker, like when they're on this bear or even thicker on the bird in the last few pages go. But when you use it super thin, it, it just, it has a little bit of a granular quality to it. And to show you another example of that, a uh, few pages back or numerous pages back, um, I'll show you how if you do a really transparent skin tone with this, it's not a great idea. So let me show you an example. Um, here, this Leia piece that I did for um, in May, you can see her skin has a little bit of a granular quality to it. Like it was done in crayon because it kind of was. It's watercolor crayon watered down, but it doesn't have a smooth, radiant feeling to it that you would if, you, if you'd use, say, Schmincke watercolors or Sennelier watercolors or Daniel Smith or anything that's a finer brand or even uh, Gansai, Tambi uh, watercolors, anything that has a finer pigment grind to it would, would be much better when it comes to skin tones and done, you know, doing something super translucent. You can see that granular texture of the watercolor crayon here too in the background. So when you use a super light, you tend to start to see a little bit of that sort of um, granular, you know, sort of little pocky quality to the paint. And it works great for textures, but not so much for a super smooth skin tone. You're going to want to use transparent watercolor if you want something super smooth. So that's just, uh, you know, something that I've learned over time is that if I want to do something that's super, super smooth, like flower petals or human skin or, you know, like porcelain or something, um, watercolor crayon translucent is not a great idea. You can, of course, make it super thick, like I said, and use it like gouache or use gouache the way it's meant to be used thick and then en emulate skin. And that'll look fine because you can get it to lie down smoother without it showing the granular, um, you know, sort of picking up the texture of the paper, but you won't be able to do that if you do it really, really thin. So use it really opaque or medium if you want it to, to, to look its best. It does not look its best if when it's being used super transparently, especially for things that you're trying to have a smooth texture to. They, if you do want it to have texture, then it's perfectly fine. And in that sense, watercolor crayons and gouache are pretty versatile because you can use them for some um, effects that are transparent and then also use them semi-opaque and then super opaque. So that does make them more versatile than watercolor in, to some degree because watercolor looks its best when it's transparent and doesn't like to be opaque or semi-opaque most of the time. But I do have to say that watercolor is the most beautiful medium because of how luminous it looks. It looks like it's a uh, gemstones, uh, you know, luminosity on the paper, whereas gouache and watercolor crayon do have sort of an opaque velvety matte look to it but they also scan and photograph better. So all of these mediums have their own pros and cons. So watercolor may look prettier in person, but it doesn't photograph as well.
And this is just something that you have to know. You have to sort of compensate for it, know it going in and everything. So, so that's going to be the pink part for the bottom part of the veil. And I'll go up and do the top part now. And I try to, like I said, I try to make it so that there was information in this, even if this is not uh, the most complicated piece. You can always share some information about technique and um, media. And um, when I do master studies, I also like to share history, art history when it comes to art periods or the, the master that we're studying, the illustrator artist that we're using as a master study reference. But in this case, there is none. <laughs> so when there's an original piece, we can just talk about technique and materials. And when there's a master study, we can also talk about art periods and um, biographical information. All fun in different ways, I hope. Okay, so I'm adding a little bit of that texture to this veil. This is mostly going to be made up because I don't really know what's going on um, that's similar in the photo because the photo is a different color, but you can use the same uh, value scheme from over there. I also changed the shape of it a bit, so it's kind of a different shape. It's a much smaller veil in the uh, photo. And I sort of made it bigger. So you can, you can follow the same general value areas and reflection and shadow areas, but sort of skew them. Skew them mentally when you're looking at them. And then you should be able to figure out what they're going to look like on, even in a different shape. Fabric and flower petals are very similar in how they're painted. Lots of fun and lots of soft edges meeting up in different areas. So if that's the kind of thing that you like, then those are the subjects you want to paint as fabric and flower petals. And if you really hate that, then that's what you want to stay away from. Uh, I like it. I, I remember when I first started painting, I didn't like this part of it. I didn't really like fabric and flower petals and such, but I've really fallen in love with how much fun it is to do soft edges now that the soft edge part of it has become very uh, meditative, you know, it feels very sort of relaxing. So I don't mind even if it's repetitive. Whereas when I first started painting, the repetition felt boring. Um, it started to annoy me after a while, and now I don't look at it that way. Now I see it as a relaxing thing that I know how to do, that I can see happen on the paper in beautiful colors over and over again, and that I can predict and understand. And it leaves other parts of the painting to be more challenging, and it leaves this part of it to be like a pleasant effect that I can deal with happening, and so that's exciting. I'm gonna go ahead and add the last bit of what I feel like looks like the, you know, she's got sort of like a taffeta or veil there going on. And so I think that's, that's what I'd like to do for her headpiece. And now we only have the little mint bin left to do and I'll do it with a larger brush. I should probably even have a larger brush in hand to do it if I wasn't doing a, a travel painting piece or um, emulating doing a travel painting piece. I'll do that all in and then after that I'd like to do a lace texture on this bin and then I'll call it a day. Now if the bin doesn't turn out to be dark enough for a lace texture then I might just do the center part of it here that I'm doing with mint and I might do more of it with a darker color or a darker blue up and down because well this is much more wedding appropriate this lighter blue so maybe I'll stick to it but I didn't want the lace to show up so I have a little bit of a dilemma here as to what to do so maybe I'll lay down with a lighter blue everywhere first and not just the center and then come back and decide what I want to do for making it darker is it, it does need to be dark enough for the lace to show up. So I don't think layering this is going to make white lace as a pattern show up on the bin. So I wanted that as a little wedding themed bin to have a little bit lace on it because well, there's no other decoration left to do in the piece. And as you guys know, I love to decorate stuff. So I figured why not the bin with some lace on it. I was thinking flowers initially because that's also very sort of wedding appropriate. And then I thought to myself, you know, I'm still working on that Pooh Bear piece with the 11 or 10 honey pots or whatever, and that's got a lot of 
flowers in it and I just did some other flowers for my past stream so I'm kind of like annoyed with flowers at this point for a little bit I need to step away from them so I can like them a little bit more again so I thought, just thought to myself why not just do something that is um, wedding appropriate but without any flowers in it and then I thought lace lace is good you have another question is cartridge paper any good for watercolors cartridge paper like as in printer paper is that what you mean by cartridge paper? Um, if, if you mean um, any kind of printer paper, typically is, is pretty much not good for watercolor because it warps too much. Um, you need to have a thicker paper that buckles less and also has made out of cotton or something that's more watercolor appropriate, which is why watercolor papers tend to be made out of cotton. And also um, it has sizing in it made out of gelatin, either animal gelatin or synthetic gelatin, depending on the brand that you get. And that gives you time to blend and move the colors around because the gelatin allows you to have some time to scoot colors around and have soft edges. But if you, if you get paper that doesn't have any of those things, no gelatin, sizing, um, no cotton content, uh, no sort of uh, texture in the sense that allows you to do watercolor layers, then it's not going to be that good for watercoloring. Even sort of expensive card stocks typically aren't the best for detailed watercoloring. You can do a simple watercolor wash on card stock or do a gouache, a simpler piece on card stock, but really the best paper for watercoloring is just watercolor paper. Um, there's other mediums that you can sort of use anything for. You know, you can use um, any kind of paper for ink and you can use any kind of paper for marker. Although there are nicer papers for marker and card stocks work very well, you can pretty much use anything. But when it comes to watercolor, there's a reason why watercolor behaves better on watercolor paper. It's because it's a medium that requires a lot of, um, you know, uh, water. And as a result of that, the what it does to the paper is pretty damaging. And so you're going to want to have paper that is sturdy enough to put up with that. And also, you don't want it to sink right into the paper like a black hole. You want to be able to blend it a bit. So again, that's where the sizing comes in. So if you get paper that doesn't have any sizing or doesn't have the more expensive content, sometimes you do. You can get wood pulp papers. This paper, for example, in this watercolor journal is not cotton. It actually is made of wood pulp, and it is worse for a detailed watercolor. It's good for simpler watercolors and medium range watercolors and also watercolor crayons and gouache like I'm doing today. But for a really complicated watercolor piece, I would not use this paper. But still, it's still meant for watercolor, so it has some sizing in it. And also, they paid some attention to how they created the paper, so it's mimicking a cotton paper in its absorbency. So even though it's not cotton, it's doing a good job of behaving um, like a watercolor paper made out of cotton. And of course, there's the sizing, like I said. You don't get to have that for um, printer paper. So if you're referring to printer paper, when you say cartridge paper, then no. And if you're referring to paper that is similar to um, paper for other, you know, uses, but it doesn't have any sizing and it doesn't have any of the um, the texture or the cotton content, then again, you're going to have some trouble with watercolor. It's it, it's gonna it's gonna be frustrating enough when you, if you use a bad paper for watercolor that you might think watercolor is not for you. So rather than do that, I would say just buy some cheaper watercolor paper because even that's better than non watercolor paper. And you can get cheaper watercolor papers from lots of people, from Strathmore, from Canson, from Fabriano has studio grade and student grade as well as artist grade paper. So you don't have to go straight to Arches. Um, you can use Strathmore paper too. And other papers like the paper in this watercolor journal. Watercolor journal is a pretty low budget investment for watercolor. If you get a small set of watercolors or a travel set of watercolors in a watercolor journal, you can try watercoloring at a smaller size and see if you like it. So that's what I would suggest you do. I can come back in and make this more even, but I don't really care to do that. I don't think it's really hurting what I want from this piece. I'm trying to figure out if the lace I want to do shows up on that swatch of um, I think it's not quite mint again, it's more of a, a bluish, so I think I might go back over it with a darker color if I want to make it darker, but what I was thinking was, I just want to sort of see, get a swatch of the same color, and I'll put it over to the left here. I'm going to see if the lace that um, I'm going to do with the gel pen shows up on this adequately. Even if it shows up reasonably, then I don't think I need to change the color. It should be fine. 
problem is waiting for this to dry. Because <laughs> I don't have a blow dryer out. I don't usually use blow dryers for my live streams because I tend to do detailed pieces where I work around on them in different places. So I never really need um, a blow dryer. So this is one of those instances where it's rare that I need it to be dry immediately. So let's just try on edge someplace and see if it works. Uh, it's not really showing up that super well. I'm trying to figure out if it's, you know, because I don't want to do a lace work pattern on here and then it doesn't show up at all. Yeah, that's not going to show up very well. I think I need to make it a little bit darker. So let's go ahead and do that really quick. And I would say that because we were heading more towards wanting a mint, then I can make it more green instead of blue because that'll give it something in the family of between mint. And I'll make it more opaque as well. So I'm, now I'm going to apply it thicker. That's the other rule for watercolor. Yeah, another question, mm -hmm. which is why is hot, hot pressed so hard and so, difficult? Why is it so difficult? Oh, why is it so difficult to work with? Well, it depends on what technique you're using. Definitely the easiest paper to work with when you start out um, is cold press because it's a middle texture. Rough press paper has the most texture and it's great for landscapes and stuff and other things you want a huge amount of texture on and Hot press is super flat and it's great for something that you want a huge amount of smooth details on like botanicals and flowers or maybe a, a fantasy sci-fi piece with a huge amount of detail. Um, when it comes to cold press, you can do pretty much anything with it. You can actually do, uh, you know, botanical pieces on it, realism pieces on it, or landscapes on it. So it's the most, the highest selling paper is um, cold press. And I've got probably more hot press than I have cold press, but mostly an even amount of hot press and cold press. And... I have noticed that cold press is easier to work with, and the reason that's so is because that texture, it, it's forgiving, okay? So when you have blended edges and areas where you can have a problem with, um, say, a bloom or color not laying down as flat, the texture is a little bit more forgiving in hiding that. That really smooth, hot press finish, it takes and absorbs the, the color differently, and it also ends up showing you every little piece of Part that you haven't blended for the color, whereas that doesn't really happen with, um, you know, the 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 cold press. It's a lot more forgiving. So, and that's why it's because if it's so iron flat, every little thing will show up on it. It's kind of like if you were gonna be doing something on a smooth surface versus a sanded surface. The smooth surface is gonna show everything that you, every mark that you put on it, every blend or not blended edge that you put on it. But the cold press has more of a sort of buffed you know, texture in comparison, it's not super flat, so it's going to be more forgiving and hide some of your sort of mistakes, you know? So that's why. But um, if you want to do the smoothest type of painting in the long run, um, when it comes to details, then, hard then hot press is hard to beat. It's really the best. But you can really use cold press for pretty much anything. So if you have hot press and you're having problems with it, then you can get a little bit of a learning curve and learn how to use it, but you don't have to be committed to using hot press forever. You can also buy a paper that's easier to work with. But once you've worked with cold press and hot press for a while, you'll find that you just won't find it as hard because your blending will become easier. I would suggest wetting the whole paper down with a wet wash of nothing but water, no color in it, if it's hot press, before you start painting. It sort of opens up the surface of the paper a little bit. Um, it has the, a really sort of harder gelatin sizing on it um, that they sort of, you know, like I said, it sticks more to the surface because it's a hot press versus cold press. So um, if you put the water down on it and saturate the paper completely before you start, it sort of um, softens up the paper for later washes and sort of um, takes off a little bit of the gelatin skin a little bit. Um, it still leaves a the gelatin there for you to have blending, but it's not going to be as hard to blend um, as far as uh, edges. So I, I heard that from a botanical painter a long time ago when they said that they did that for, uh, she did that for her, her hot press paper. And I don't have to do it anymore because I don't paint at a large, large size for my streams or a lot of the stuff that I've been doing recently. But anytime you're doing a larger piece, it would be, it is helpful to go ahead and wet your whole paper down. And that will help you later on for washes, for hot press. So you don't have to do that for cold press, but for hot press, it will make it easier for you to blend on the paper.
It sort of just breaks in the paper, breaks in the paper for you. So hopefully that's uh, helpful. And if that's not what you meant as the question, then feel free to ask again. But I hope that's, if that's what you meant, then I hope that answers it. And as you can see, I've come back in with a more of a green overcoat on this to and again, if you want to make this super solid and one colored, then you can come back on with a third coat. And I'm not going to do that because for the purposes of the stream, I really don't care about that. But if you care about that, you can totally come back and do that later. But you can also see how when it's more opaque that it gives you really solid coverage. The watercolor crayon really starts to look like gouache when you get it on here super opaque. And these little edges that you see here that are sort of showing up, they can just be blended out with a, a damp brush and in a circular motion just dab at it, but try not to do it when it's too wet because it'll pick the paint up because remember this is a lifting paint. So, and where I've done this paint so opaque, I will re-ink because as you can see, the more opaque the paint is, the more it hides the uh, ink line. So the ink line is totally disappearing Oh, it's not totally disappearing because this is a light color, but it's, you know, significantly subdued is what I would call it. So it, it does cover it up somewhat. And so that's just something that you have to keep in mind. And again, I still prefer to do my inking first because sometimes I don't re-ink anyway. I just only re-ink parts of it to bring it more to the foreground. And I, do, I actually like the faded ink sometimes more than a super sharp ink anyway. It's just a, a look that I prefer. Unless it's comic book art, uh, I don't see what's wrong with semi-hidden ink lines. Okay, so I've got that now. Now I can do my little ink, um, I mean my little lace on the basket. And that's totally up to you how you want to do it. So I'm going to see if this is dry. This is mostly dry. And again, this is warping a bit. You can see it warping because it's pretty wet. Once this is dried out and you close this book up, you can even close it up while it's still wet, it'll, it'll flatten out completely. So don't worry about that. Same thing for why I tape paper down when I'm doing other watercolor pieces, is that the paper will warp and then you can go ahead and do that. Okay, so hold on. I'm gonna use a pencil now for just my skeleton of where I want my lace work. So I'm just going to put a single line there. And just say that I'm gonna put one line here Another here, sort of lifting up my watercolor crayon, which you can also do on purpose if you wanted to. So you can come back and scrape out your paint, but that's not my intention. So I'm just giving myself the lightest embellishment of pencil or hint of pencil there. Now this stupid pen is like clogged, so I'm gonna run it around over here. And sometimes just dipping it in water and rubbing off the end of it makes it run again. So I'm going to dip it into my little water bucket on the left and then I'm going to shake it a bit and then run it around on this part of the paper. And if that doesn't work, then we might have to do this with white paint or another gel pen. I can see it starting to, it's starting to come back to life. It's alive, it's alive. Hold on, I, it's dead again. Defibrillator time. Okay, so let's see, I, I think that hopefully it'll work. Let's see, bring it back over here. And if it doesn't, I can, like I said, get my other gel pen because I really wanted to do this lace. We went through so much trouble. We put on a second layer of paint here and so this bin's getting laced up whether it likes it or not. I can just go get my other gel pen. I think I'm gonna do that. Maybe you can get it for me. I'm gonna see if Elijah can find it. It's really hard for him to find stuff else in there. And there's a drawer there that has markers in it. So if you open it. 
No, it's like the third. It's like the the flat bar in the tabaret. In the tabaret, the long flat one. Yeah. So now there should be a white gel pen in that bar. Yep, that's it. Now this is the archival one anyway, so hopefully that'll work. Okay, I'm gonna sneak out from underneath the camera. Okay, so let's see if this one's gonna work any better. This can just be the the tail end of this live stream can just be how white gel pens should never be bought by anybody because they um, clog and um, desert you. They are the Benedict Arnolds of art supplies. When you need them, you find out that they have traitorously jumped ship. Okay, so I'm still trying. Scribble, scribble, scribble. Okay, I'm gonna try on another piece of paper because I'm assuming that this might work someplace else. And I'm about pretty close to giving up on doing it with that. All right, it's over. We're not doing it with that. We're gonna do it with paint. We're gonna do it the old school way before pens were invented. Going back to an era where there's only fire to light the cave. No gel pens are in existence and we have to use this white lump of hardened paint to paint our lace. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and really get a lot of white paint from right there. And this is a, luckily, a nice fine tipped brush. And I'm actually gonna soften this up further for when I come back by putting a spray of water on there. And I'm gonna come right into here and start painting that lace. Okay, so. That's the first leg of that. You can do your lace design however you want. The great thing about lace is it's kind of like henna tattoos or zen tangles, is that you can pretty much turn it into whatever you feel like doing. And this paper is a bit warped, so I think my lace might end up being smaller and larger in some places, but you can always go back and fix that. Gouache lifts, or you can leave it that way if you want it as an imperfect look. All of it is okay. Either way is okay. The important thing is, are you happy with it and did you have fun? So, but yeah, I only ever, I actually only bought gel pens twice. Two different kinds, the kinds that you saw right there. And I bought them for live streaming. I never used them before that because I always heard how they clogged and caused problems. And I just thought to myself, I don't want to have to deal with that. And you just have a perfectly reliable white paint to use, but they are a lot more convenient and they dry faster than white paint. So if you're taking them anywhere, then you know, it's a lot better to use. Now, see how this line is thicker here? And just go ahead and shave some of it off. Now, this, you could do this with a gel pen too. So if this had happened with a gel pen, you could do it with a gel pen too, because I told you the gel pen is water soluble, or, or at least it is temporarily. I don't know if it dries hard or anything, but anytime I've tried to do anything water soluble to the gel pens, they lift up. So you can always correct um, if you don't like something. And if you make your paint thicker and let it sit in your brush too thick, your lines will get fatter. So try to make sure it's like at a medium cream consistency. Too thin and your lines will bleed and too thick and your lines will get fat. Okay, so now what I want to do is the center part of the lace. And we can make this quick lace, and if we make the commitment to, oh, it doesn't matter if the lines are thicker or thinner, then it'll go faster, and if I can just say I don't care, they would have been all the same width if I had done them with the gel pen, and that's what I was aiming for, so I'm a little bit sort of not wanting to let go of that dream of perfect fine line lace. But if you want to do this fine line with a brush, then use a spotter. Don't use uh, a brush that's round like this. Use a spotter. Um, so let's see. And the center in here uh, can go like this too. And just think to yourself of all the different lace trims you have seen in the world. 
and just think of what you can make up that will look like one of those trims or just search for lace on Google search and look at the different kinds of lace out there and maybe use inspiration from one of them. Um, nobody's going to care if you use a lace pattern for something. So it's not like lace patterns are copyrighted or something like that. And if we're ever going to get to a world where they are copyrighted, then that's ridiculous. So hopefully you can just use the lace that you find anywhere without anybody coming after you with a, a machete, you know, which is... You have a question, what's a spotter? A spotter is a 20 over zero, super small sized brush that basically looks like it only has a few hairs in it. So you might see it in miniature painting sections or um, just in detail painting brushes. Or in every one of your videos. Yeah, and you can see it in a lot of my videos. I do a lot of uh, spotter um, brushing, um, so you can see it in, in a lot of my videos too. But um, it is definitely not hard to find and it is super cheap. So, and you can replace it as often as you need to. I, I found that they can last for several years, even with the kind of abuse I put into them because they're so tiny and thin that uh, even frayed out, they make a pretty fine line. And like I said, we're not going for perfect lace here because I didn't get out my spotter for this because I was expecting a gel pen. So we're just going to do some kind of lace and it just has to be something that is decorative on this bin and makes it look wedding appropriate. And if you want to leave your bin completely blank, or if you just want to watch this and not even do bears sitting in a bin, you think, well, that's silly. I'm not drawing bears in a bin, but I'll watch it. That's fun too. No pressure to do any of that. I watch a lot of things that I wouldn't paint, but I still watch them. <laughs> It's fun to watch people paint stuff, even if you're not going to paint it yourself. You always learn something. So I'm just doing little X's to make it look like that the little lace circles there are connected to the outside of the lace frame with something. If you want to make them just float in there, you can do that too. But I'm trying to assume that this is like somehow real lace on this weird fake bin that these bears are sitting in. So that's just a problem that I have, but you don't have to do that if you don't want to. And like I said, this is far from exact anyway. It's just turning into a very loose lace rendering. So, and it still looks good. Anything that gets busy enough and gives you good texture, it doesn't have to be perfect. It just, just by being busy, it starts to look good. Um, texture is always good, whether you're doing stylized painting, realism, super loose painting, um, you know, ink sort of cartoonish drawings. It doesn't matter. It's all, all good. Okay, so I think what I want now is a little sort of another hill coming out of here for to build up my lace work. And I think instead of doing a super complicated interior to that, I can just do a sort of connected like this. And then I'll line down the center. Again, it just has to look like it's been laced through somehow. So if you can do a double line, just think about how if it was connecting to itself as a little lace thready thing they would be doing. And then I'm gonna add like a, a top to that part of it to go higher up onto the the bin and then we'll be done. And this little thingy is bigger than this little thingy, so we can match it up or we can leave it. And since it's loose, I'm gonna leave it. If you were trying to match it up, then you can erase it with your other damp, clean brush. Any type of gouache can be erased. And just make sure it's not super wet. If it's super wet, you'll take out the bottom layer too. So you wanna use a damp, almost dry brush to correct, not a wet brush to correct. It has to be almost dry, so it's like a damp brush, damp clean brush eraser. And I don't think this is a bad stream for the first time on YouTube. It had its problems with the beginning of it being a private stream because apparently that's what YouTube automatically defaults to. And it also had its problems with uh, the 
gel pens deciding to Benedict Arnold on us, but apart from that, I think it's been okay. And it's not the most complicated piece, but I think it was fun. It's a fun piece to, to do quickly. Okay, so that's that part of it. And now I think what I'd like is, let's see, let's do the little interiors, uh, the parts that are turned into a flower. So let's do the little lines out of that first. It's not quite a flower. I mean, I don't know if anybody knows what I'm talking about. It's like those little lace edges that, and everything looks floral or phallic. Just remember that, but it's floral, okay? So that's what it is. Let's just turn it into a flower as quickly as we can. But now it's a lace edge, which is what I was going for. There's only so many shapes in the world, so everything's going to look like something else. It's got flower edgy things off of it, so can't tell me it's not just lace. Okay. Again, we'll do the skeleton part of it first, and then go ahead and throw in the rest of it. And I'll make those guys a little bit longer this time. And you can see how this would be easier if you did it with a gel pen because you wouldn't have to worry about your line going thinner and thicker and also your paint getting thinner or thicker. Um, so it would just be the same line width and it would be the same paint density as long as it doesn't clog on you, you know, so it's the clogging part of it that causes all that problem. But see how that's turned into a lace uh, that I wanted? So that should, once I get across to the right of it, that should be a finished piece for what I wanted to do for today. Do you have any more questions, comments, inter anything interesting? No, people are just talking about how they like the stream and that they uh, thought that it was better once it got brighter. Okay, good. Well, I'll try to remember that for the future. It's kind of annoying that it looks brighter on my camera and not on the stream, but I'll just have to keep that in mind for future streams. I literally got like so many light bulbs on this desk, shining lamps on it, so it looks super bright to me and then it doesn't show up that way on camera. I guess I'm just, uh, the camera that I have or the streams or something, it does it a little bit differently than what it looks like, so that's the disconnect. But I'm glad that um, you did mention it, uh, the lighting, and that I fixed that so that people could see it uh, brighter because I don't want people feeling like they're watching me stream this in the dark. <laughs> so, and you can also see how you don't have to, the more busy the lace gets, the less exact it has to be because it really starts to turn into a pattern and less of a looking at one space so it doesn't really matter that it's not super exact I don't think I recorded the first part of it so if I do condense this then we'll miss the little bit of the beginning of the other bear but that's okay I think you also could have painted, like I said, flowers on this bin or left the bin blank. So I'd still use the woven basket. It's all, all possibilities here. You have a request for a glass dip pen demo. Oh yeah, the glass dip pen is something that I showed briefly a long time ago for the Brusho crystal colors demo and then we never really got around to demoing it um, I should do that as an ink piece. I'll, I'll try doing that uh, in a future master study because I'm sure one of those like a Charles Dana Gibson Gibson girl piece or maybe another tenure piece or something like that or Maybe maybe Henry Voigt somebody somebody else does good inking, but 
Just a plain ink piece done with a glass pen. What do you think your next streams are going to be? Um, well, I've got them planned out for this week and next week. So for this Thursday's stream on Twitch, we are going to be doing the finish, finishing up our MUCA Evening Star study, which is a realism ink tense piece with a, it's going to be weird, the underpainting, the undervalue painting uh, last stream two weeks ago before I left for, um, to visit my parents. And now we still have left to do um, just the, the color part of it, which is going to be the interesting part. And people would like to see, I'm sure, how you layer color over the neutral value of underpainting. And again, I've done that before in past videos, um, but this is the first live stream that I'm doing that much detail in for that kind of Versailles um, technique. So if you want to check that out, that's going to be on this Thursday you know, on Twitch. And you can see where to subscribe to that if you go to my about page and go to my website, just harjermeeks.com. It has all my links there. Just to, My website's only one page. It's just a front page with all my different links. So it's not some massive website that you have to go hunt through. But if you just go to harjermeeks.com, you'll find my Twitch channel link. And next week I was going to do probably a Frazetta study, and I do think I should probably work in a glass pen study because I have that on my list for a while and I keep forgetting it. But here we are, we're done with our bears, and if I want to tweak some of the lace or some of the other stuff later, I can. But this is what it looks like for now, and I'm pretty happy with it. You, you, just because it is a simple piece, there isn't any reason to keep doing more layers of value or detail on these bears. I can go back, and I probably will go back, with this chocolate brown marker once everything is super dry and come back in with re-inking it because you can see how just re-inking that spot right there makes it darker so the lines will show up much brighter. Do you see that? So because we use this so opaque um, it, it is going to be useful to come back and re-ink these lines because they will totally look different and show back up. So that's definitely the finishing part of this piece. And I don't think I'll do it on the stream on online because I don't think you guys would be that interested in seeing the whole thing re-inked again. But definitely I wanted to show you just a, a sneak peek of the fact that I wanted to do that. Just because you can see that it makes a big difference. There is a big difference between ink that has been covered up underneath and this is the same color, the same chocolate brown. But it looks almost black in comparison to where it had faded underneath the ink. So. You can go back and re-ink the whole piece to sharpen it up. You can always do portions of it if you like certain parts to be faded into the background or things that you wanted to think again about maybe not having as hard of an ink line on. You know, you can always make a slight correction that way. But I um, hope you guys enjoyed this stream. I will be posting the finished uh, piece on Instagram. You can follow me on Instagram too. And um, check out my later streams and videos this week for the... Luca study, upcoming Frazetta studies, um, upcoming, hopefully, glass ink pen studies, and also finished pieces from previous videos I recorded that haven't been posted yet. I've got a few of those as well. So just uh, follow me on my YouTube and Twitch and Instagram, and those are the three main places that I really go to now. And hopefully, if you have any questions, you can totally feel uh, free to ask me in the comment box. I will go there after and stop streaming. And if it's the same as Twitch, I don't know. If it doesn't disappear, then I can answer some questions there. Otherwise, you can always message me and or leave a comment on another video, and I will get back to you and answer your question or answer it in a future stream. If it's a really long answer, then I'll tell you I can answer it in a future stream too. So hopefully you guys enjoyed the stream, and um, um, thank you so much for being the people who watched my first YouTube live stream. And I hope you enjoyed it. I'm wishing you all epic uh, watercolor crayon gouache adventures and hope to see you next time. Take care. Bye. I love you guys.